Deborah, do you want to go on? We would like to touch the, the, the subject of, of China a little bit, which crosses two things. One, what you just said about how capitalism is manageable or not, and how will the US and China relations will look like in the next period, uh, and then go back to the issue of nationalism, xenophobia, and the far right globally. Deborah, do you want to, to go on in the first part of the... Yes, if I could complete on that. Um, we were talking yesterday about uh, the rise of China, its consequences on, on employment all over the world, and um, the fact that China is occupying uh, global governance. Plus, but what really... Um, uh, we we're really trying to grasp was um, from the point of view of the left forces in the US, how, how could I and fight for better employment conditions or I'd say even environmental justice without placing China as a threat? Because this actually works. And I, in us, um, that would be. Is there a non-nationalist or at least a non-xenophobic approach when dealing with China for the American work, or working classes, at least for seeable future? Okay. And that, in that question, Leo, just to compliment Deborah, what we're discussing, and you've already said that in other interviews, uh, the the. The topic of China is, is a, a bipartisan uh, theme, both for Democrats and, 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 and Trump. So whether Biden gets it now, the rise of China will continue to be represented as a threat, either a geopolitical threat or a threat to the employment of American workers. So how to, how to better understand that? Uh Okay, let's get the first couple of things straight first. The restructuring of American manufacturing industry does not begin when China, uh, with only with American agreement, after they had resisted for so long, the American agreement came under enormous pressure from the American capitalist class, especially Wall Street. Uh, uh, so. Uh, that restructuring of American industry has not begun, begin with China's admission to the WTO in 2001. The restructuring of American industry begins in the 1980s uh, with the way in which the crisis, the dollar crisis, the profitability crisis of the 1970s was resolved, which is the massive unemployment uh, that the Volcker shock introduced. Uh, the forcing uh, of bailed out auto companies uh, to reopen their contracts uh, and, and uh, reduce workers' wages and benefits, uh, and the movement of the American auto industry increasingly from the cities of the uh, Northeast uh, uh, to uh, uh, the southern United States, first of all, and even rural Ohio or uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, that restructuring, uh, which does so much to change the capacity of the American working class, long predates China. And, you know, when they're moving to factories in the south, where do you think they're moving? They're moving to factories that are owned by German and Japanese companies, which are treated uh, the same as American capital, and indeed are induced by subsidies from those southern states. Uh, so no, uh, this, this cannot be explained now in terms of the sudden emergence of China. Uh, no doubt what makes the making of globalization viable for a period is that the Chinese very cheap products or the Chinese components that cheapens products from the jeans that people wear 
uh, to that are imported by Walmart and used then to drive a small clothing manufacturer or retail outlet out of business, often in those small rural areas. Uh, uh, that that does mean that the American worker can reproduce herself or himself, reproduce their standard of living, uh, even though they have suffered such a relative wage decline, because their genes are cheaper, because the cell phone becomes cheaper. Uh, so you know, one needs one needs to see this as an integrated whole. People who speak of the China shock, this is all China, are not getting it. They aren't putting it in terms of where China fits in the history of this. And in what, rep, in what aspects it fits. It fits least in terms of the internationalization, internationalization of financial capital, uh, as I was speaking to before. Um, and and uh, in that sense, the forces that will continue to promote a further integration with China uh, will be very powerful. And that's the sense in which Biden will use his rhetoric against China uh, in order to facilitate more and more the opening up of financial services in China uh, to uh, be run and and a profit made out of, a surplus made out of it by uh, foreign financial firms, not only American, obviously, uh, but but many American. Um, so that's how I see this. Now, the, the very important strategic question that Deborah Point posed, look, if we are really socialists, there is nothing wrong with the word protection. What else should a socialist government do but protect its working people? We are not globalizers. We are not capitalist globalizers. We do want to find a way out of capitalist globalization. We do want more inward-oriented economic development. We want more planned investment. There is no conceivable way of dealing with the scale of the environmental crisis without economic planning. It's absolutely inconceivable. Uh, and the way in which states have been internationalized, they've been internationalized to facilitate uh, the competition of capital, not democratic control over investment. So we are looking for a way to deglobalize, but to do so in a non xenophobic, non-racist way. So I can tr totally envisage a demand for democratic economic planning uh, in Brazil led around the ending of uh, export agriculture uh, as the top priority to feeding over 300 million people in a balanced way, right? um, I can easily imagine calling for democratic economic planning uh, in the United States uh, or in Canada in a way that is oriented to shifting investment uh, towards more domestic production in a more balanced way, and above all, to more to radically balance uh, environmental. Uh, uh, supportive production. Uh, we would need to do this in a way that doesn't target an enemy. That's the cheap way of doing it. We would be needing to do it by building on, uh, yes, the you know emptiness is in many respects of the Paris Accord, but building on the norms that it legitimates at least. Uh, to say we want to be doing this in conjunction with China, uh, helping it overcome its own contradictions, because there's appalling income and wealth polarization in China. And its own planning capacity is being, even in capitalist terms, is being challenged. 
Uh, so we want to do it in conjunction with other countries. It's not going to be done overnight, obviously. Uh, you have to be, be able to build, rebuild the factories to produce genes again in the United States, right? Um, but, but we can do it, I think, in a way that says uh, we will be committed to doing this. We will take steps towards doing it. Uh, and we will try to learn from you as we do it. Uh, and we will try to do it in a way that builds support for us. That's all more easily said than done. But I see no other way forward. Not only is the socialist left, but for humanity in the 21st century.